At the recent launch of the new Mitsubishi Triton, we concentrated on the flagship GSR. But the bulk of sales will come from this, the GLS. So, very simple. Is it any good? And should you buy one? Stay tuned to find out, but before then, like the video, subscribe to the Car Sales channel, and give us a comment with your thoughts down below. Let's get stuck in. Like for like, the Triton GLS has risen about $7,500 compared to its predecessor, which is a fair old hike. Nevertheless, it still undercuts most of its main rivals, albeit by a much smaller margin than before. The likes of the Hilux SR5, Ranger XLT and D-Max LSU are all at least a couple of grand more expensive. The GLS sits towards the top of the Triton range, but it still looks quite plain. Now that sounds a bit negative, but I just mean unadorned. At this level you get 18 inch alloy wheels, LED headlights and various chrome exterior trim. White and red are standard, blue, grey, black and this silver are an extra $740 and metallic white is an extra $940. Mitsubishi still offers its 10-year, 200,000km warranty as long as you service at its dealers. And if you do, you're looking at around $2,500 for the first five visits, which is pretty standard, but this rises to around $6,500 over the first 10 visits. One of the big changes for the new Triton is under the bonnet. It's still a 2.4-litre four-cylinder diesel, but there are now two turbos instead of one. Power and torque are much more competitive, and while it's still a six-speed auto, and no manual is now offered, fuel consumption has improved dramatically. It does require AdBlue though, which reduces emissions, but does increase running costs. Hop inside, and like the exterior, the interior is pretty plain, but again, I don't necessarily mean that as a criticism. It's not fancy old school manual handbrake, analog dials, proper gear selector, but I don't mind that at all, and I suspect a lot of potential buyers won't mind either. There's plenty of hard plastic in here, but the leather wheel feels great. There's dual zone climate control, pair of glove boxes, which is excellent, though the GLS does lose the in-dash cup holder of the GSR, but the HVAC controls are well laid out and super easy to use. The infotainment is from the Outlander and pretty easy to navigate. There's also the selection of hard keys, which always makes life easier. CarPlay is wireless, as is charging, but Android Auto is wired. However, I must say CarPlay reconnects very quickly whenever you restart the car. There's a heap of information in the digital screen between the dials, and much of it is actually quite useful. And with a bit of practice, it's relatively easy to find your way around, which will become important later on. Triton has not only a reversing camera, but Mitsubishi's 360 degree monitoring system, as well as parking sensors front and rear. Every active safety box is ticked and plenty more besides, including trailer stability assist for towing, though front cross traffic alert is a no cost option, presumably as plenty of people will fit bull bars which aren't compatible. The new Triton is a fraction longer and a little bit wider, but the wheelbase has been extended by 130 millimeters, which has done wonders for rear accommodation. As with most dual cabs, it's not exactly luxurious back here, but I've now got a decent amount of space. There's USB-A and C ports and a 12 volt outlet, and these roof mounted air vents, which, if you think about it, make a lot more sense than having ones located down around your shins. One slightly strange choice Mitsubishi has made is a single central top tether for attaching kids seats. On the plus side, it means you don't have to flip the backrest down to attach it, which is always a pain, but on the downside, you've got to loop the straps in and around the headrest and it all gets a bit awkward. Where the new Triton has taken a big step forward is around the tray. All the numbers have gone up, which is positive news. It's around 35 mil longer, but 75 mil wider, and there's an extra 60 mil between the arches. It's not class leading, but it is definitely more useful, as is the max towing capacity increase from 3.1 to 3.5 tonnes, and payload is around 200 kilograms greater at 1,075 kilograms. Even when towing at maximum capacity, you still have around 600 kilograms of payload to play with, which is better than most, and a tub liner is standard along with multiple tie down points. So the new Triton is definitely a step forward in terms of interior ambience and load carrying capability. But what about the driving experience?
I'll start on road and then we can go and be a bit more adventurous. But let's begin with the good stuff. This is a much improved car over its predecessor, as you'd hope, really. The longer wheelbase has calmed the ride, the steering is much more direct and really nicely weighted. The bigger footprint means it handles better and the engine is more responsive and more powerful. And those fuel consumption numbers seem pretty reasonable too. But there are a few shortcomings and some fairly fundamental ones. This gearbox is a bit shunty. Maybe it's just this car and it needs a reflash, but frequently on, I think it's the two to three change, it just gives you a bit of a lurch. Likewise, the suspension isn't right. The steering is really quite good, but it feels out of phase with the rest of the chassis. Like if I just rock it back and forth like this, because there's a delay, fraction of a delay, but a delay nonetheless, between the input and the rest of the car responding, you get this pendulous effect as a sort of momentum builds up. If you go for a speed bump at pace, or if you hit some bigger bumps at speed, it can also take a few moments for the car to regain its composure. Like a wave in the bath, it takes a few goes to subside. I'm not a suspension engineer, but I'd guess it's under damped. It just doesn't have the body as under control as you'd like. Unfortunately, the new Triton joins the ranks of cars that need to have a driver assist function turned off every time you start the car. In its defense, it's only the driver monitoring system and it's relatively easy to do so through this central screen, but because there's a sensor here on top of the steering column, Unless you literally drive along like this, never moving your face or eyes, it constantly beeps at you. Also, the start-stop system is pretty clumsy in the way it both stops and starts, so off it goes. But now let's head to some rougher stuff. One advantage Mitsubishi still has is its super select constant all-wheel drive system. It's no longer a feature exclusive to Mitsubishi. I mean, a GWM Canon can be constant all-wheel drive, but you need a V6 Ranger or Amarok to get it, apart from the Megabucks Wildtrak X. Hilux doesn't have it, Navara doesn't have it, D-Max doesn't have it. It's handy for added control on wet tarmac, but even on loose surfaces like this, where you could run it in four high without hurting the car, just having the center diff unlocked makes the car a bit more maneuverable. Out here, the Triton is actually pretty fun. The steering makes it agile, is a fundamentally friendly balance, and I will say one advantage of the six-speed auto is it's not constantly trying to figure out which gear it should be in. The new Triton is also pretty handy off-road. In a sense, it's gone backwards. The wider footprint that makes it better on road means the turning circle is increased by about a metre, the approach and departure angles of the old car are actually slightly better, and the longer wheelbase means the ramp over angle is not as good. But, more stable platform, much easier steering, more responsive engine, new generation traction control. This thing, even on these highway tyres, is pretty capable, especially with the rear diff locked. One feature that would be handy is trail control, or off-road cruise control. There's hill descent control, which works fine at a snail's pace like we are currently, but on descents that are steep but not crazy, like this one for instance, it's nice to be able to cruise down at like six to eight k's an hour rather than taking forever to reach the bottom, as we will currently. All in all, kudos to Mitsubishi for delivering improvements across the board with the new Triton. The price is higher, but it's better in every area. And yet, the verdict is kind of what it's always been with the Triton. If you want the absolute best, this ain't it. And yes, I'm going to mention the R word. A 2 litre XLT Ranger might be a few grand more expensive, but performance, dynamics, load space, tech, it's better in a lot of the areas that matter. However, as we learned from the comments on our Triton launch video, you'd buyers are typically a partisan bunch. So if you're a Mitsubishi fan, chances are you're gonna love this thing. It has everything you like about the current gen Triton, no nonsense approach, long warranty, dependability, but is better in almost every area. So, is it good? Yes, but not great. Should you buy one? If you like Tritons, absolutely. Otherwise, maybe shop around. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, hit the subscribe button, and leave us a comment down below with any cars you want to see us review.